This is WEFT Champagne, 90.1 FM, community radio for East Central Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org. The views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of WFT, its board of directors, associates, its station manager, or Prairie Air Incorporated. The following program is pre-recorded and consists of two parts. The first part is a rebroadcast of a program first aired in 2011. The second part was recorded on March 6th, 2016. Welcome to Weekend Heartbeat. I'm Sean David, and this is A New Lamp. New Lamp for Old. New lamp for old. Remember how Aladdin headed out to get oil for his mother's old dented, tarnished lamp? And in the market, he met a magician calling out these words. This strange man was offering to give him a brand new shiny lamp for his old one. That's what I want to offer you, if you'll have it. A new lamp of spiritual guidance. But maybe you already have such a lamp, which still burns brightly. Great. You are still welcome to join us simply to learn who we are. But maybe your lamp of divine guidance has gotten dented and tarnished like Aladdin's. Or perhaps you have no such lamp at all. To you, I offer a new lamp. Hi, my name is Marilyn. Welcome to A New Lamp, a program designed to make you acquainted with the Baha'i religious faith. I hope you will choose to spend the next few minutes with me. Thanks. I have risen this morning by thy grace, O oh my God, and left my home, trusting wholly in thee. And committing myself to thy care Send down then upon me Out of the heaven of thy mercy A blessing from thy side And enable me to return home in safety Even as thou didst enable me To set out under thy protection With my thoughts fixed steadfastly upon thee There is none other God but thee, the one, the incomparable, the all-knowing, the all-wise. I have risen this morning by thy grace, O oh my God, and left my home, trusting wholly in thee. And committing myself to thy care Send down then upon me Out of the heaven of thy mercy A blessing from thy side And enable me to return home in safety Even as thou didst enable me To set out under thy protection With my thoughts fixed steadfastly upon thee There is none other God but thee the one, the incomparable, the all-knowing, the all-wise.
Today, I am going to tell you about the Baha'i calendar and holy days. In the Western world, the Gregorian or Christian calendar are what we use, which puts us at 2,011 years after Christ. The Jewish people have a much older calendar they use among themselves. The Islamic nations use the lunar calendar, which is about 700 years less than the calendar we currently use. The lunar calendar, based on the movement of the moon, is shorter than the solar calendar, and so the year is shorter, and the months and the holy days of Islam move forward each year and don't stay the same. I find it a little confusing, but you may well say that about the Baha'i calendar, as we tend to do with anything unfamiliar. I must admit, living my life around two different sets of time can be confusing to me. For starts, the Baha'i day starts at sundown and ends the following sundown. This is not unlike the Jewish and Islamic days. With each new religion, the people begin their new calendar with the time of its founder. For us Baha'is, this is the year 168 of the Baha'i era. This is a solar calendar based on the movement of the sun, so it has 365 days and stays the same each year. However, instead of 12 months of 30 days, our year consists of 19 months of 19 days. This brings us to 361 days. The four or five days left over are referred to as intercalary days and used as a time of holiday with gifts and general festivities. The first day of each 19-day month is a feast day, not necessarily a feast of food, but a feast of the spirit, a time of spiritual renewing and being with our fellow Baha'is. There is first a devotional time of reading the Baha'i writings of our founders, often with music included. Baha'u'llah tells us, music is a ladder for the spirit. A time for business of the Baha'i community is next, followed by a time of fellowship, which includes some form of refreshment. The Baha'i year begins on March 21st, the vernal equinox. It has been celebrated in Iran, Old Persia, for many centuries as Nauruz, New Day, and still is. President Obama has sent a Nauru's greeting to the people of Iran each year since his presidency, a thoughtful gesture to a people struggling with the matter of human rights. The next holy time is Rizwan, April 21st through May 2nd. Baha'u'llah declared this to be the king of holidays. These 12 days commemorate the time Baha'u'llah declared his mission. You may remember I told you about the time he spent in a garden so all could come to bid him farewell as he left Baghdad for Constantinople. Three of these days are considered holy days on which work is to be suspended if possible. May 23rd is recognized as the day the Bab declared his mission as the forerunner of he whom God will make manifest. May 29th remembers the spiritual ascension of Baha'u'llah. The term ascension in the Baha'i faith refers to the physical death of the person and the ascension only of the spirit. July 9th commemorates the martyrdom of the Bab by firing squad in Tabriz. In the fall of the year, we have the birth of the Bab on October 20th and on November 12th of Baha'u'llah. In the lunar calendar, these two dates are next to each other, the one being born in 1819 and the other in 1817. So in those countries using the lunar calendar, they are celebrated as the twin birthdays. November 26th, as remembered as the Day of the Covenant, commemorating Baha'u'llah's appointment of Abdu'l-Baha as his successor. November 28th, we remember the ascension of Abdu'l-Baha. This brings us to the intercalary days, or Yamaha, February 26th to March 1st. Fun, games, gifts. At the end of a Yamaha are 19 days of fasting. Fasting is total from sunrise to sunset for all between the ages of 15 and 70. Unless there is good cause not to do so, such as illness, pregnancy, work of a very heavy nature. So we have gone from feasting to fasting and back to feasting on March 21st, Nauru's. Now wasn't that fun? Next week I hope to tell you about Baha'i marriage and funerals. Till then, if you have any questions or comments, you may contact me at anewlamp at yahoo.com.
O pen of the Most High, say, O people of the world, we have enjoined upon you fasting during a brief period, and at its close have designated for you Nauru's as a feast. Thus hath the day star of utterance shone forth above the horizon of the book as decreed by him who is the Lord of the beginning and the end. Let the days in excess of the months be placed before the month of fasting. We have ordained that these, amid all nights and days, shall be the manifestations of the letter Ha, and thus they have been bounded by the limits of the year and its months. It behooveth the people of Baha throughout these days to provide good cheer for themselves, their kindred, and beyond them the poor and needy, and with joy and exultation to hail and glorify their Lord, to sing his praise and magnify his name. And when they end these days of giving that precede the, day, the season of restraint, let them enter upon the fast. Thus hath it been ordained by him who is the Lord of all mankind. Baha'u'llah. so much for being with me this morning. I hope you have found a blessing during these few minutes. If you want to learn more about the Baha'i religion, you can go online to www.bahai.us. To contact me, my email address is anewlamp at yahoo.com. Thanks, and have a great day. Welcome to a new land. Our guests for today are Donna Kegel and Sue Old, uh, Baha'is from uh, the area. And they are a couple of busy ladies with some interesting work as well as hobbies. Hi, Donna and Sue. Hi. Thanks for having us. Hi, Donna. Hi, Sue. Okay. Um, so are you folks all fasting right now during our fasting season? I have been fasting. It's difficult. Um, I have at times taken some drinks of water. Um, but I'm trying to go at it with the right attitude. It reminds you of being deprived of all of God's bounties. And when you're on earth, you are not in touch with all of God's bounties. And it's kind of a reminder of that. Um, and I work on my attitude toward it. I'm guilty of counting how much more time there is to go. I, <laughs> I do that occasionally. But um, other than that, I feel I'm getting a lot out of it. Great. Great. Um, I used to fast, but I developed lupus, so now I just say the prayers. Well, I admire pe the folks who, uh, for the love of the faith of God, do this each year. I, I don't fast because of my age, but I try to do prayers and, mm -hmm. and keep in touch. Okay, ladies, we, we like to hear something about who our visitors actually are. Uh, so, Donna, would you start, just tell us a little bit about yourself, besides the fact that you love horses. Oh, you love horses. <laughs> <laughs> I do oh, love horses. <laughs> one thing I know is that, that uh, you and I started out living about 16 miles apart up in northern Illinois. But uh, you go ahead and tell us something about who you are. Um, I hail from Peru, Illinois. The high school there is La Salle, Peru. I was raised in the Catholic faith. I went to parochial school. I have been steeped in thinking about global issues, in thinking about poverty. Um, I am deeply grateful that I was raised in the sight of God. So 
um, much of my early training was with Jesus Christ. Hmm. This was mine. Sue, let's hear about you. Um, I'm actually originally from Los Angeles. Um, really? And my family background's Episcopalian. Okay. When I was christened as a child, um, the minister said something about children who aren't christened are going to hell, and my dad had a big argument with the minister about that, and so we didn't go to church after that. Oh, dear. And my dad said all children are blessed by God, and, and God would never do that to children that aren't Christian. And so I was raised to love and respect God and the Word of God, but I wasn't raised in a church. So it helped me to find the faith, I think, because I was already thinking in very universal terms about yes. spirituality and, re and respecting all religions. Okay. Uh, so how did you happen to find the faith? Uh, so it was actually through the music of Seals and Crofts when I was a teenager. I heard them on, interviewed on TV, and they talked about the principles of the faith, and it made a lot of sense to me. And then I went to college, and I attended my first fireside and learned about the faith, and so I've been a Baha'i since I was 18. Oh, that's so. wonderful. Yeah, it's amazing what uh, these folks who are in the arts, how they influence others, isn't mm -hmm. it? And Seals and Croft mm -hmm. definitely did that during their era. And Donna, I know you have an interesting... Uh, story to that includes Sue about how you found the faith. <laughs> I I think it's kind of interesting. I um, have always felt that Yahweh or the Christian God or Allah must have been the same being. And Sue and I worked together and I was at work one day and someone said something rather bigoted about either Jews or or Muslims. So I became angry and I marched into Sue's office and I said, when are people going to learn that Yahweh and the Christian God and Allah are the same being? And she stayed very calm and she laughed and she said, I have a book for you to read. <laughs> it was entitled Thief in the Night by William Sears. And in that he delineates many of the Christian Bible writings that foretell the coming of Baha'u'llah. It was very interesting, very enlightening. Mm -hmm. You were a Baha'i for a long time. You just didn't know it. <laughs> yes, I had, uh, I had and, basic beliefs that were conducive. Yes. I think that's often very true of, of people coming into the faith, that somehow or other we have picked up these ideas on our own. They just We didn't have a focus to put them in. So that that's great. Uh, well, we four people have similar things about our working background uh, that I think is going to produce a very interesting conversation today. You ladies both work in the VA hospital, uh, and I was a nurse uh, hospital and nursing home, and Sean is a veteran. And was a medic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, we're a little uh, overlap here. <laughs> yes. So a, a little, a little touch of, of these four areas hitting together. Uh, so, who would like to start? Um, you ladies, we want to hear about your work. How does the Baha'i faith influence your work? When I was about eighteen or nineteen, um, I could have gone into horse racing. I have relatives in the business. Mm, really? I did a visit. I looked around, and I realized I could be happy doing this, but I also realized that's kind of self-oriented. And I started thinking about ways in which I could help other people, and that is when I became more interested in the counseling profession. Mm, very good. Alcoholics and addicts are often a stereotyped um, population. Many mm -hmm. people don't want anything to do with them. So we are doing as Jesus said. We're doing as Baha'u'llah said. It's spirit of service. It's yes. spending time with perhaps, uh, Jesus would put it, the least of my brethren. I was thinking that same phrase. <laughs> yes, yes. That's why I like what I do. Um, I, I think I really like what I do because um, I've always been 
less judgmental. Um, I've always thought it was really important to see each person as an individual striving to be a better person. Mm -hmm. And in the Baha'i writings, it says we're all created from the the same dust so that one wouldn't ever hold himself up higher than another. So it really helps me to um, see people with alcohol or drug problems or with other issues as just striving to be a better person, the same as you or I. Um, and I really like working with this population because there are people who have identified that there's an issue for them to work on. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of us have issues, but we don't re really recognize them. And so um, we just let it go, you know, but these are people who really are focused and trying hard to make their lives better. So among the people you basically, you are both working with the addicts. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we Not work just in, the general population of the VA. Yeah, we work in the substance abuse rehab program, and our focus on is on rational motive behavior therapy, mm -hmm. which is about looking at the way we think about things and changing our thoughts to be more productive and um, make think about our long-term goals, so that our behavior will be such that it helps us achieve our long-term goals. Mm hmm and that works really well with substance abuse because obviously if you go drink, then you're not going to go to work, right? Right. So hopefully, you know, you'll think long-term goal and you'll go to work instead of going to the bar. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just about changing your thoughts, changing your behavior. And looking for a different outcome. Yeah. And my specialty is teaching anger management, which is really interesting working in the veteran population because the demands for fairness because of all they've been through in their lives and, and looking at how those demands for fairness can get them into trouble and to um, have them be able to be more forgiving of themselves and other people really mm -hmm. helps with anger management and it helps them stay clean and sober. That's good. That's Some of these things are hard for all of us, let alone if you've got an addiction like that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, if we can think of these things as an illness and and uh, not something the person really wants to be. Mm -hmm. Nobody really wants to be an addict, I don't mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we could have used some of that uh, help on active duty. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's one of the, you know, they, uh, I guess nobody, nobody tends to volunteer for that assistance when they're sort of surrounded by their brothers, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew a lot of people who, the description you just made up on active duty who, mm -hmm. who could have used that kind of help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a very stressful job. Mm -hmm. Addiction is um, definitely spiritual malady, but it's, um, we're, we all have some spiritual malady, things sure. that we're trying to work out. So certainly I am not elevated above they and just as in the Baha'i faith or in the Christian faith, we don't want to elevate ourselves over other people, mm -hmm. nor are we less. Yeah. And some veterans struggle with that. They think they are less. And yes. when I'm interviewing, when I'm assessing, I'm constantly on guard for that. Is this veteran blaming himself? Is he blaming others? Is he doing both, he or she? And I'm looking for that and I'm trying to help them with that spiritual malady so that they can get on with a more productive life. I noticed uh, during my years working in hospitals and nursing homes that uh, some of these folks have a, a double problem if the staff don't understand uh, there seems to me like there have always been a few staff members who looked down on these people, who let them know that what they thought of them, and you know so that's that's such a bad attitude for anybody in the medical or social service areas to have. Uh, that mm -hmm. you know you're they're they're there they're there because they need you, mm -hmm. and. You're there to not be judgmental. So mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard if there are staff people who are that way. Mm -hmm. Our supervisor likes to say that a few of the veterans are hard to like. 
Um, <laughs> they are. A, f- a few are hard to like. A few are extremely easy to like. Um, but what I try to remember spiritually is that loving them all is that is my spiritual obligation. Mm-hmm. And there's usually something redeeming that you can find if you continue to look. The, uh, the unlovable person is the one that needs that the most. That's probably true. Yeah. Also, because of um, our, the Baha'i teachings, we accept, respect all religious faiths. When we have veterans that are of the Muslim faith or Buddhist or follow Native American beliefs, mm-hmm. um, they appreciate our openness, acceptance, and um, respect of their beliefs when we work with them. So it's helpful. That's great. I'm sure it would be. Yeah, it's been tough for some of the Muslim veterans. It really has. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, and right now is such a hard time for uh, Muslims in this country. Mm -hmm. Just Mm -hmm. kind of fingers have pointed at all of them as being the bad guys. And here they've served their country. Many of them serve their country overseas. Yes. And so it's really important to be appreciative and respectful of their beliefs, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. That was always a challenge. Mm -hmm. Um in overseas, it was always a challenge that, that we had Muslim soldiers in our ranks, mm-hmm. and yet it always seemed like, to me, it seemed like the chaplains were more interested in trying to persuade them to change their beliefs than to honor their belief, which is a direct mm-hmm. contradiction of what the chaplain's role is supposed oh, to yeah, be. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, but. Sure. And things have really changed for the better. I mean, one of the the chaplains at the VA found a Quran and gave it to one of our veterans, which I thought was really thoughtful. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that was good. Now, you guys were talking up a storm the other evening. I I know you've got things to say. Well, one of the things, too, is Baha'is don't drink, and we don't abuse drugs. And so also that's helpful in your profession if you're a substance abuse rehab Mm -hmm. therapist because um, we're talking with people about how can you cope with stress in your life without the stress reliever of going to have a beer or go drink or go use, Mm -hmm. and how can you have a social life without drinking and using. And and actually, we, we... do we have a social life that involves people who are clean and sober um yes and so we can actually give them examples of ways we enjoy our lives without using and drinking Mm -hmm. so i feel like it it's helpful to them to know that we're doing the same thing that we're asking them to do you know Mm -hmm. right yeah, like an active duty, that was one of the things. I didn't drink, and um, so that put me on the outs, but only to the extent that I put myself on the outs, because if you still spend time, if you still go out with the guys, and, you know, of course, you sort of automatically become the designated driver, mm-hmm. you know, which is always a, a service, uh, but then you can still wind up having the bonds of friendship, even mm-hmm. though you're not actually participating in it. But it it is an obstacle. Uh, mm-hmm. to that's one of the reasons why I'm I'm sure why the substance abuse becomes so high is mm-hmm. because it is kind of a rite of passage in mm-hmm. order to get in with mm-hmm. the with the group. You know, I, I knew many soldiers who had so much trouble fitting in with the group and found the only way that they could because of social awkwardness mm-hmm. was to go out and, and, and drink with them. That was seemed to be the shortcut, the mm-hmm. social lubricant. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, for guys like me who didn't want to drink, we had to kind of actively act like the life of the party. Even I know for me, I had to go beyond my comfort zone to become a little wilder than I might want to be <laughs> in order to be accepted by the group. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, go along with a little more than I might have normally gone along with as long mm-hmm. as it wasn't causing any permanent harm just to be able to show that I'm willing to, mm-hmm. I'm willing to, to um, be one of the guys, to be one yeah. of the guys, yeah. Yeah. You know, take, judgmental. share the risk, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. The other thing we see with our veterans a lot is rough childhoods. We see that very frequently. And then the military experience on top of that, often, there's a double indemnity as far as their trust issues, their ability to bond with other people. And a lot of them are cynical. And even though they've taken a lot of risks in a military sense, they are not willing to take risks as far as being close to other people, trusting other people, really letting go and letting out love. Um, mm-hmm. You see a lot of the veterans really struggling with that. And when you urge them, a lot of times they don't want to take that kind of risk. 
And it's such a privilege when they open up to you and share their lives and their wounds and let, allow themselves to be vulnerable and trust you. You know, it's really an amazing part of the job and it's something I will always treasure, you know. I'm sure it takes a while to build up that to that point. Yeah. Yes. But Sue's right. The highest, best thing, best three words you ever hear come out of a veteran is, I trust you. Mm -hmm. I can believe that. I mean, I feel like my my work really moves my heart. I could be doing something making more money. I could have chosen another degree that would have um, given me more income. But there's a lot more fulfillment in, in what I'm doing. I really feel like I'm touching souls. I really feel like there is great potential for them to be better parents, better workers, better able to connect up with other people. And I feel like most of them probably will find spirituality someday. There is some research that says around the third year in sobriety, people reach kind of a spiritual crisis. They begin mm. to ask spiritual questions. They um, start to crave more spiritual reconnection. It's almost like the sobriety is kind of a preliminary for all that to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the program where we work, it, it isn't a 12-step program. It's really based on dealing with coping skills and, and helping people um, think differently about how to deal with the stress in their life. But we really urge them to have a spiritual connection in their community to help them, a net, like a recovery network. And that's where 12-step is really wonderful yes. because they can go to meetings, they can go to um have a sponsor they can go to churches and connect with a, a recovery group at their church or their mm -hmm. synagogue or, or even at the mosque they can and and it's really good for them to be able to find a connection in the community a spiritual connection that can help them deal with the loneliness when you make a, a lifestyle change and all of a sudden you're trying to figure out who you can hang with now mm -hmm. who can be your friend who can you call right. at two o'clock in the morning because it can't be the old people that you were using and drinking with you know mm -hmm. right Many of the veterans struggle with self-forgiveness. When you think about the things that they've had to do or the things that they've seen or the, the level of brutality and violence that they've seen, there's, there's trouble with cynicism. There's trouble with what might be within. Many of them have fear of their own anger because they could really hurt somebody if they mm -hmm. became very angry. So dealing with those kind of things is very difficult for the veterans. And for some of them, their own faith is, is quite the asset. And we are trained to work within what's called a patient's preferred defense structure. And many times I find myself using their spiritual faith as a tool for their emotional healing though I have to be careful at that time to stay within that person's spiritual outlooks. Yes. We do have chaplain service to help with that. But many times for some of the veterans, that will flow very naturally where they're talking about self-concept or they're talking about family life. And they go into spirituality really on their own. And... um I think that my faith background, both the Christian and the Baha'i, makes me very comfortable when my veteran is ready to shift that gear. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, have some who just kind of never reach that point, who are just not interested in the spiritual side of life? And uh, I would think that'd be pretty discouraging to work with people like well, that. Well, not, not really. I mean... Um, you could understand that there are some combat veterans, especially, who have um, decided that prob that God doesn't exist because of all they've seen, the mm -hmm. horror they've experienced, the mm -hmm. trauma. And um, it's you can work with them. I mean, it's fine. It's really fine. That's the thing about not being judgmental and not um, challenging their um, their understanding their spiritual understanding, um, even if it's t t that they're an, an atheist, because 
you know, we're there to be supportive of them and to help them learn how to take better care of themselves. Right. We're not there to to challenge their worldview in that mm-hmm. in that way, you yeah. know. And who am I to say after they've been that through that kind of trauma? Well, you should believe in in God. I can't say that to no. them. I don't know what it's been like to be them, and you know that's between them and their maker. They're you know we really can't say that to anybody. No, actually. no, uh, yeah. Yeah, our relationship with God is so personal and private exactly. for every individual and changes, yeah. evolves over time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, invariably, when you ask a veteran, how do you do the things you did? He says, my training, my training. And I was thinking when Sue was talking, it really is the training. I am so used to staying within a patient's preferred defense structure that that spills spills over to the spirituality too and the other place where the training comes in is not only do you not take the veteran to spirituality if the veteran does not want to go there it is also a thing of letting them um oh set the timetable and the the focus and the the subject matter you know and our training also dictates that we do not um give advice. We mm-hmm. do not tell things directly. My job is to artfully try to help veteran get there by him or herself. Yes. And many times we're having a conversation where I'm not asking questions. In good counseling, you don't ask a lot of questions. You do a lot of reflective listening. And all of a sudden, something will come out of him or her that makes you both go, whoa, what was that? And Mm -hmm. they really need to come to the conclusion their self. And even when they're in that spiritual realm, that's usually how it goes. Suddenly, there's a new realization. And both of you are kind of like, Wow, that was fun. That was beautiful, <laughs> especially when it is of the spiritual realm. Yes. Mm-hmm. All that is neat. So uh, just out of curiosity, now we've heard so much about the problems with VA hospitals and uh, the money and lack of doctors and can't get them in. Does this affect your work? Well, actually, for our program, just I really can only talk about our program. Yeah. But for our program, we're set up in a way that we can really take whoever wants to start our program the day they walk in and talk to the coordinator of our program. We can start them in the substance abuse rehab program. They go through an assessment, and then they're given a case manager, and then we work with them and set up a schedule. There's really, for our program, purposes of our outpatient intensive Mm -hmm. substance abuse program there's no wait which we're really grateful for because when someone comes into treatment and they want to help with substance abuse issues you really can't say wait a week that doesn't work for them (laughs) now is is the time yeah they're ready now absolutely so basically your patients are primarily outpatients they're outpatient yeah the only catch can be sometimes is getting housing and and so sometimes finding them a place in the community or if getting a bed on on station can be difficult. So mm-hmm. we, have to, we have work with different options to do that. Sean, when you were out in the field as a medic, now these mm-hmm. ladies were talking about how the effect of being out there uh, under fire affected them, their spiritual impact. What can you say about it? You, you could, were from the medic side and i know right. you have to have had seen some really awful things yeah um not as awful as as many uh i was pretty pretty lucky the team before us uh actually had one of the last of the big um uh attacks of our time in the theater this was a a, a, a weapon ied a roadside bomb that was specifically engineered to be able to destroy our most armored weapon our most armored vehicles mm. And so, you know, we got hit by IEDs, explosives, all okay. the time. But it was just loud bomb and, and smoke and um, maybe a little scratched paint, and then everybody's fine. And in this case, it actually killed a couple of their people. And this mm-hmm. is right near the end of the deployment. Uh, and again, this didn't happen to our group, but this happened to the group that we replaced. And uh, 
to me, that was probably the most poignant thing there was talking to their medic who had to deal with that, who was on site at the time, and him telling yes. me that whole story. Because um, it's, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. But I had just yes. gotten there, so we didn't know if it was going to happen to us or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but, in, you know, this was a young man who was obviously going to be going home with a lot of, his entire unit was going to be going home oh, really? with a lot of difficulty because they'd made it in a one year deployment. They'd made it through like almost 11 months of their 12 month deployment mm. with no casualties, no problems. And then the little, just before they go home. Oh, that's heartbreaking. It isn't was it? really, really heartbreaking. And, um, you know, uh, I had a loss of words. Uh, you know, I mm -hmm. just got there. Um, and, uh, what can you do or say when you're confronted with that? Mm -hmm. um, for myself, we were hit by shells. We, uh, I worked in the hospital and there were people there who had been in accidents or, or who had been uh, injured by war, wartime activity. But for the most part, I, I wasn't directly, I wasn't directly uh, affected. I wasn't directly attacked. Mm hmm um, the, uh, the only enemy combatants that I actually ran into were guys that needed medical care because they'd been chased down in the desert by some of our CID guys, the, the, uh, um, the, uh, military, um, police. And, uh, they were really, really friendly. <laughs> and so the, uh, the CID guys had to remind me, these are the enemy, you know, don't get too, don't get too casual. It's like, but they're such nice guys. Um, Sound like a program on mesh. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was very much like that. Um, but the this it was the day to day stresses. A lot of the again, and and mesh is such a good example of 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 this mm -hmm. because so much of the military bureaucracy in any kind of a unit, but especially in a medical unit, winds up mirroring what you see in that show. The show is an exaggeration, obviously, it's an extreme comedic exaggeration. But there's always sort of why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Isn't yes. this not safe? <laughs> or why are we doing it? Why aren't we doing it this other way? When we yeah. talked about doing it that way, but now we're not going to do it that way. And all these command, all these ideas and decisions are being made way above your level, and you mm -hmm. don't know what's going on. And even though you yourself may not be in physical danger, you know, you you well, you you are is in physical danger, but you, you're not in 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 mortal immediate mortal peril. You're not getting shot at. You're not getting directly bombed. Right. But you feel so vulnerable because you're not sure the people whose responsibility it is to take care of you are actually doing their job, mm -hmm. and that's terrifying. And so mm -hmm. that's why a lot of the people that I ran into came back with a great deal of stress. Mm -hmm was because of this feeling of, of, of not being taken care of, of not being safe. And what happens with this is lots of times we'll work with the, the veterans who have issues with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. They'll come into our program, they'll, they'll be clean and sober by the time they're done with our six-week program, and then they'll transition into PTSD counseling, and they'll stay in the working with a PTSD therapist, a psychologist, for a long time. It really, it's really helpful to them. But uh, it's an important piece to get clean and sober before they start the, the PTSD therapy. I think, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. But it's good. It's, a really, it's really good the way our two programs meshed to help a veteran, mm -hmm. you know. That's wonderful. Going back to what Sean said, um, he sounds like such a typical veteran when he says, well, I didn't see much. Other people right. just had it so much worse than I do. And it's like, wow, that sounds like what we hear every day. Really, when we take a look at PTSD, what happens to these people is they're serving next to each other in these very violent and desperate situations. And they know that they're never alone and they know that these other people have proven their mettle and it creates a bond like none other mm -hmm. these are bonds that are maybe mm -hmm. closer in a different way than spousal bonds it's very very compelling and much PTSD deals in what I saw happen to my buddy mm -hmm. or what I saw happen to the people that live in that country it's it it is spiritual it's very deep um and it's threatening as regard to their sobriety there are veterans who will tell you i know if i go back to alcohol and drugs bad things are gonna happen but what has happened at times in the past is 
I would sell my soul to the devil for two hours of feeling numb. Now there, you've got some PTSD problems and a lot of other things to deal with. It's never just addiction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you run across much in the way of potential suicidals, I would think? Yeah, we do. We um, There's a whole protocol for us for, for dealing with and evaluating on a pretty regular basis if a client is suicidal and mm-hmm. how to help them. We do contracts with veterans in terms of suicidal ideation and who to call and what you know how to take care of themselves. And, and really the big emphasis is always ask for help. There's a, a crisis line, a 24-hour crisis line that veterans can call yes. anytime, you know, so there's always help available to them. Mm-hmm. Suicide is very scary for families and people that know that veteran. It's also very scary for the professional. Statistically speaking, many completers of suicide give no indication. Mm -hmm. I have also had veterans tell me very straight up, I know you ask me the suicide question every day. If I am ever suicidal, I am not going to tell you. It's a very scary realm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, We used to be, we were taught uh, that if somebody indicates that they're going, that they're thinking about it, that's the person to watch. Yes. But that's just not necessarily so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it can get so confusing. I had one soldier. I was in a unit in California that was uh, assigned to uh, the task of preparing soldiers for going overseas. And uh, I was assigned to the medical clinic there. And this was the unit that we were uh, processing had done multiple deployments. Mm -hmm. And uh, a soldier came into my clinic and said, I'm thinking about killing myself. And he basically said it exactly like I just said it, just straight up the bat. And I'm thinking about killing myself. And, uh, and so I'm coming in, you know, because I, I I think he said, I don't want to go to on the deployment, but I just don't want to, you know, but I, I, I'm going to kill myself. And my react, I didn't know how to react. You know, I, I don't, one thing I don't, you know, medics have a little bit of training in this, Mm -hmm. but this guy was just so flat. His affect was so flat Mm -hmm. That I I couldn't decide if he was just trying to if he was trying to scam us he'd be much more subtle, mm-hmm. but if he were for real wouldn't he be much more emotional, and so I didn't know what to do so I ended up calling Arsara I called I contacted his command, which I don't know I, well I contacted my command they com- they contacted his command I didn't know what to do I didn't know if we should report him to his unit or not I had no idea what to do, mm-hmm. uh, but they did and they called and the sergeant major came in apparently this kid had had said this kind of stuff before and the sergeant major just leaned into him just started yelling at him and all this kind of stuff and and I, like is this appropriate is this what you're supposed to do and no. i but i i did not know what to do or say and nobody else mm-hmm. in the clinic really did either mm-hmm. so we're like oh don't worry about it doc we deal with this guy all the time da, 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 da. he's always like mm-hmm. this. like isn't that a problem that he's always like this mm-hmm. the flatness is probably um clinical sized depression and right. so the flatness in ways is exactly what you would expect when someone comes in and says, I'm thinking about suicide. Mm-hmm. You might not see the strong emotion. You might see mm-hmm. that real um, flat tone of voice, um, eyes that look like there's nothing behind them or, mm-hmm. or, or not really an emotional look on the face. That can actually be some very bad signs. Yeah. Sometimes, too, when people leave the military, they're leaving this structure that was really comfortable for them. Mm-hmm. E- even though they had been in, in combat and they'd been through a lot of difficult times, still, they really liked the camaraderie. They liked the structure of, of military life. They go into civilian life and they'll feel really lost. And sometimes drinking, using is part of trying to fill that void when they've they've left the military. Yes. So if you get a combination of feeling hopeless, helpless, and worthless, it's really a setup for suicidal ideation. So it's really important in, in what we do to instill hope in people, to help people feel a sense of that they can, we want to empower them, mm-hmm. that they can make positive changes in their life, that they're not hopeless, they're not helpless. And of course, they're not worthless, you know. All right. Two weeks ago, a veteran asked me, why are you always complimenting me? I said, I don't compliment you. I make observations of you. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Are, uh, do most of these people have uh, good family support? We really see a mixed bag. Um, 
some of them have very staunch wife, mother, brother, and some have really pulled back from other people. A few, then there's another special subset. They will tell you, I will not let anyone get close to me. Then you start working with, with that veteran. You start working with their hurts, their depression, mm -hmm. their lack of trust, um, PTSD, very strong lack of trust. Many of them, there's a long legacy. And what's important then is for me to never abandon him. Um, a few of the veterans will act badly trying to get you to reject them. <laughs> that is the last thing you want to do. You do not reject the veteran for acting badly. Yes. You can always find a quality that you love about someone. Always. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. It takes a little looking sometimes. I, I know a lot of times when I would uh, come on to a ward and I'd be told about such and such was a, a patient that was a problem patient. And, and to me, that was an immediate challenge. <laughs> you know, I think, okay, she thinks this is a problem patient, then he's got a problem that I've got to look for. Mm -hmm. One of the good things about working with veterans, though, is, and Donna's touch on this, is the camaraderie. Mm -hmm. I mean, you feel it so strongly in, in the treatment center that the way they try to help each other and the connection they feel with each other, it's really therapeutic. The other thing to remember is everybody's got their own intelligence, and those veterans are so darn intelligent. They, So many of them can read people so mm, well. Really and well. when we go into a group session, I love group session. When I'm in group session, I'm thinking, am I really getting paid to do this? It's a gas. <laughs> um, so I was in group session a few weeks ago, and one of the veterans said something really profound and intelligent. And a different veteran looked at me and said, who's the teacher now? And I said, that's <laughs> supposed to happen. We have so much wisdom in this room. And I said, and remember, when the veteran does say something that's very intelligent and very moving, it actually is a sign that, that the facilitator is doing a good job that hour. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> well, Sue and Donna, we are so glad that you've been with us today. Thanks so much for your insights as to uh, working with the veterans with their addictions and their post-traumatic stress problems that you work with every day. And we really appreciate your having come and shared with us. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, so what we do at this part of the program is go into reading some of uh, the writings from our faith. Would you two folks be willing to join us on that? Sure. Great. Man reacheth perfection through good deeds, voluntarily performed, not through good deeds, the doing of which was forced upon him. And sharing is a personally chosen righteous act. That is, the rich should extend assistance to the poor. They should expend their substance for the poor, but of their own free will, and not because of the poor have gained this end by force. For the harvest of force is turmoil and ruin of the social order. On the other hand, voluntary sharing, the freely chosen expending of one's substance, leadeth to society's comfort and peace. It lighteth up the world. It bestoweth honor upon humankind. Abdu'l-Baha This handful of days on earth will slip away, like shadows and be over. Strive then that God may shed his grace upon you, that you may leave a favorable remembrance in the hearts and on the lips of those to come. Abdu'l-Baha <laughs>
the music on today's program were The Guardian and The Last Look by Grant Hinden Miller. To find out more about the high events taking place in Champaign-Urbana, or if you'd like to listen to previous New Lamp programs, you can go online to www.cu-baahai.org. Or if you would like to learn more about the Baha'i national and international community, go to www.bahai.us. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again next month. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to this week's Weekend Heartbeat on WEFT Champaign 90.1 FM, Community Radio, Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org.